matches my shirt, I think. I didn't know. Well, they say uh, aloha here. I'm from Oklahoma, and we say howdy y'all is what we say back home. So, you know, Paul, I think, was from the Oklahoma or that area. You know, he always sends his letters y'all, you know. So now, it's great to be here, though, and just appreciate the hospitality already, uh, just being here. And thank you so much, whoever it was who made that gift uh, for Cheryl and, and for myself. We really appreciate that very much. That's uh, a great blessing to be, uh, be here with you all. And uh, hopefully we brought some of the rain with us. Maybe I understand you all have had a drought over here. So it doesn't seem like a drought. We drove around the island yesterday, and up here it was raining yesterday as well. The drought seems to be on the other side over there. But, but anyway, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And, and I share uh, the pastor's uh, sentiments as well and, and how the Lord's work to bring us here. And Tommy Ice is here as well. And he'll be a great blessing uh, to you all. And, and Jack Hibbs is here. So. You know, I've, uh, I got associated with Calvary Chapel several years ago. I was invited uh, by Ed Cornwell and came and spoke at the uh, Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. And I've, I've said this a lot of different places, but the association that the Lord's allowed me to have with Calvary Chapels over probably the last, I don't know, when were we there, Cheryl? Probably six years ago, something like that, has really been in my ministry one of the greatest blessings in my life. Uh, just meeting pastors from Calvary Chapel churches, people who are like-minded, teaching the Word of God. So it's been a, a real blessing uh, to me, and, and we pray it has been to the churches as well. Well, tonight I want you to open with your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to talk tonight about uh, the topic of the rapture. Whenever uh, people ask me to come speak somewhere and they don't tell me what I have to talk about on prophecy, I usually talk about the rapture. Because I love this event of prophecy because it's really the event that got me excited about prophecy to begin with. A lot of you remember um, back, he just mentioned a moment ago, Hal Lindsey. <clears throat> a lot of you remember back in May of 1970 uh, when the late great planet Earth came out, that book by Hal Lindsey. It was the number one selling book um, of the 1970s, sold, I think, sold almost 30 million copies. And in May of 1970, I was uh, almost uh, 11 years old, turned 11 that summer. And uh, that book was, you know, of course, very wildly popular during the whole 1970s, on even to the 80s. But during that period of time, uh, my sister, who was, who was a couple years older than me, everybody in the youth group was reading that book of the late great planet Earth. So I remember as a, a young teenager, I don't know, I was 12 or 13, maybe something like that, I read the late great planet Earth. And, you know, obviously a lot of it didn't sink in, but it began to dawn on me how much of what was happening in the world at that time fit in with what the Bible said about uh, the end times. And, of course, if that was true in 1970, how much more is it true uh, today? But this whole idea just gripped me, though, of how things in the world were being set up for the coming of the Lord, but especially this idea of the rapture of the church, that the Lord was going to come someday and catch believers away to heaven. Well, a lot of you probably saw that movie, A Thief in the Night. Remember that movie that came out after that? Some of you who are younger, anybody seen that movie, A Thief in the Night? Russell Doughton put the movie together. And uh, if you watch it now, I mean, my kids watch it, and they like to laugh at it. I mean, it's kind of like a B kind of movie. You know, it's kind of acting's kind of cheesy in it and all. But I remember watching that on either, it was either a Wednesday night or a Sunday night at the church I grew up in. And that was back in the old days when you had the old reel-to-reel -reel projectors. You remember those? And the things would kind of rattle. And I remember I was sitting right next to it, and you hear the thing kind of rattling as the thing's turning. And they had it up there on the screen. And I don't know, I was probably 13 or 14 when I watched that movie. And I was just mesmerized by this movie as they talked about prophecy and the Lord's coming. But then at the end of the movie, uh, the rapture takes place. And there's this pastor who's been telling people about uh, the Lord's coming. And he's out mowing the lawn of this church. And it shows him you know, mowing up and back. And all of a sudden, the, the camera leaves and it comes back and the mower's sitting there running and he's gone. And then there's another scene where there's a, a, a lady who's lying in the bed and her husband's in there shaving before he goes to work. He's using one of those old electric razors. And they're talking to one another. And he's been sharing with her through the whole movie about the coming of Christ. And she's not a believer, and he is. And suddenly she's talking with him, and uh, she doesn't get a response. And she walks in there, and the razor's lying there in the sink buzzing, and he's gone. And, of course, she does this kind of real cheesy and acting's not very good, you know, but this shocked look on her face that he's gone. And several of these events take place, and then at the end of it, there's a group of people, which, you know, back then they called them hippies, you know, and they were, it was, it was, they were singing the old Larry Norman song. You know, two men walking up a hill, one disappears, one's left standing still. Wish we'd all been ready. A husband and wife are lying in bed. She hears a noise. She turns her head. He's gone. 
I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. Now, I remember that night walking out of there. I mean, I was a, that was a, a watershed event, really, in my life as a young person. Well, about a week later, I got home from school one day, and I came home, kind of ambled home as I did, you know, walked going down the street, and I came in the house, and my mom wasn't there. And uh, <laughs> my mom was always there when I got home from school. And uh, my sister was always there because she got home earlier, and my younger brother hadn't even started school yet. They were always there. And I walked in and kind of started looking around, went all around the house. Nobody was there and looked out back, you know, where there's still hung up clothes on the clothesline back then. Nobody's there. And all of a sudden, you know, you guys already guessed it. I thought to myself, what, what if the rapture happened? I, I, was, I was a Christian, but you know how it is when you're younger sometimes. You know, you wonder about things in your life and whether you really know the Lord or not, have lack of assurance maybe of your salvation. Well, I started looking around all over the place, and I start to panic, and I think, I'm going to call my dad at his work because if he's not there, I know I'm in big trouble because <laughs> you know, he's always there, I mean, at this number that I would call. Well, about that time, my, my mom, my sister, and my brother came in the door. They'd been next door. A widow uh, lady lived next door to us, and they'd been over there seeing her and came in, and I was probably as relieved as I've ever been in my entire life. But I remember as a young person, about 12 or 13, those events making a, a marked impression on my life. And I became very interested in prophecy. Now, it was kind of dormant for a while, but in my early 20s again is when this whole idea came back because I wanted to understand the Bible. And so I began uh, to study Bible prophecy. And my favorite Bible prophecy event to talk about is the rapture. And I love it really for two reasons. One is it's, it's the blessed hope that we have in this world we live in. I mean, if there's no coming of Christ... Uh, really, everything in this world is meaningless. He's not going to uh, come back someday and set things right and redeem this world and take us to be with himself. And the second reason I love to talk about the rapture is I believe it's the next great event in the fulfillment of prophecy. And if we want to define the rapture, really the rapture is that future event when the Lord Jesus is going to descend from heaven and those who are alive on the earth at that time are going to be caught up, body, soul, and spirit glorified to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture. Now, at the same time as the rapture, there's going to be a resurrection of those who've died of their bodies. But the rapture particularly has to do with those who are alive. But we'll talk about this tonight. At the same time, there's a resurrection of the bodies of those who've died as well, of believers. Now, there's three main New Testament passages that talk about the rapture, I believe. John 14, 1 to 3, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. Now, I want to look tonight and focus at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and I want to talk for uh, most of our time about the truth of the rapture. What is it? What's going to happen? But then at the end, I want to talk for just a little bit about the timing of the rapture. And that is, when is it going to happen? Now, I don't mean when's it going to happen, like what day or what month, but when's it going to happen in relationship to the tribulation? Is it going to be pre-trib or mid-trib, post-trib, or whatever? So I want to talk about the truth of the rapture and the timing of it. Now, to talk about the truth of the rapture, I've got three main points I want us to look at. The certain promise of the rapture. Uh, then what I call the chronological program, how things are going to unfold. And then finally down in verse 18, we'll see uh, the comforting purpose of this rapture. Notice in chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede uh, those who've fallen asleep. Now the first thing we see here in verse 13, I call this the reason. Why did Paul write this section here about the rapture? We always need to ask that when we study the Bible because we want to understand the context and why is this here? Why was it written for the original audience? Well, the first thing he says is he didn't want them to be uninformed. Now, the King James says, for I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. Remember here in uh, Warren Wiersbe say years ago that the fastest growing denomination in America is the Church of the Ignorant Brethren. And uh, that's sad but true. But, you know, a lot of people say... You know, we don't need to really talk about Bible prophecy. 
There, there's a lot of people out there today that think that's really something that we don't need to discuss. They'd say, well, you know, someday the Lord's going to come and it's all going to be over, but we really don't need to worry ourselves with it or study it or understand these things. But notice Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed about these things. He wants us to know about it um, and to understand it. And he also wrote this too to alleviate their grief and their confusion. Notice what he says, so that you won't grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, here's what probably had happened. You remember Paul on his second missionary journey? Remember, he's over in the area of Troas, which is the, the uh, w- far western part of modern-day Turkey. It should be like this. I'll turn it around easier this way. The far western part of Turkey. And then you remember he crosses over the Aegean and goes over first to Philippi. And he's there at Philippi, and you remember they're run out of town there. And the next place they go to um, is down to uh, Thessalonica. It's in Acts chapter 17. And they get run out of town there, and they go to Ber- down to Berea. And Paul goes on down to Athens by himself, and then finally ends up down in Corinth. And it's at Corinth that he writes First and Second Thessalonians back to these believers up at Thessalonica uh, that he was with. Paul was probably there for a period of six or eight weeks. Now, in Acts 17, it says he reasoned with them in the synagogue with the Jews for three Sabbath days. So some people think he was only there three weeks. He was probably there longer. That's just how long he had a Jewish ministry. But when they ran him out of the synagogues, he probably ministered to Gentiles longer because it seems like most of the believers there were Gentiles. So he's probably there six or eight eight weeks or so. And then he's forced to leave. He's, He's run out of town. Let me say this, though, just for a second. This is a little bit of an aside here. But think about this for just a moment with me. If Paul was only at Thessalonica for six or eight weeks, when he writes 1 and 2 Thessalonians back to these people, think of all the stuff that he presupposes that they know about. In 1 Thessalonians, he writes to them about the doctrine. He writes to them about election. He writes to them about the Holy Spirit. Um, He writes to them about sanctification. Uh, You know, this is your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. He writes to them about the nature of man, that man's body, soul, and spirit. I mean, he writes to them about the rapture and the day of the Lord. Then you go over to 2 Thessalonians, he talks to them about the day of the Lord, uh, the removal of the restrainer. I mean, he talks about the coming man of sin or the Antichrist. That means Paul must have taught them all of that stuff in the six or eight week period when he was there. Now think about this. Most people go to church for 50 years and never hear that stuff, right? I mean, that's true today. And what that shows us is that today in the church, we've dumbed down the teaching where it's just all a bunch of kind of pablum or my old uh, grandfather used to call skim milk. He called it blue john. You know, it's just uh, almost that bluish color. But that's what's being given out today. Think about the doctrine that Paul had taught these people in a short period of time. And to me, that's a great... Uh, motivation for pastors today and teachers to teach people the Bible, to teach them these great truths. But what had happened is when Paul got run out of town, he taught them all about the rapture. He taught them all about the coming of the Lord. And then he gets run out of town. And by the time he finally ends up down at Corinth, it's been a few months time now. And evidently they sent news to Paul that some of the believers there in Thessalonica had died. Probably a few of the believers had died in the meantime. And their question was, will those who've died, are they going to miss the rapture? Are they going to miss out on this great event? Are they going to be like second-class citizens when this takes place? When are they going to be raised? How do those who've died fit into these end-time events? So the Lord wanted them and us to understand what's going to happen uh, to give us hope. Now he says here, we don't want you to grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, it's not wrong to grieve when someone dies. I remember uh, Cheryl and I, uh, I did a funeral a few months ago, or actually about a year ago, for, a, for an elderly lady in our church, and she was buried in another town in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we drove over there, and we got there a little earlier than everyone else, and we were sitting there uh, in, in our car, and about, oh, I don't know, eight or ten feet away was a headstone there. And on the headstone were those words of Tennyson that he wrote years ago, which says, we long for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that's still. And that's a, a powerful description of what it's like when we lose someone that we love very much. We, we long for the touch of a vanished hand. We long for a voice that's still. So it's not wrong to grieve, but it's wrong to grieve as those who have no hope. I mean, Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. But we're not to to weep inconsolably for a believer because we know they've gone to be with the Lord. Now, when he uses the word sleep here, 
He says, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who are asleep. Notice on down in verse 14, he says, if we believe Jesus died and rose again, he'll bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Then down in verse 15 at the end, he says, we won't precede those who've fallen asleep. That word that he uses over and over again, the word sleep there, is the Greek word koimao. Now, you, I tell you that word because it's the, the full word was koimeteria, and we get our word cemetery from that word. So what it, ha- what it has the idea of is a, as a, place where body, or a place where bodies sleep. That's what a cemetery really is. In fact, as I turned in here to the church, there's a cemetery just on the other side of the road. And that cemetery over there is a place where bodies are asleep. I mean, it's a dormitory, really, if you will. That was why this word was used in ancient times of a dormitory, a place where people slept. And what this is telling us is when someone dies, the body falls asleep. Now, when it says they fall asleep, it doesn't mean that the soul falls to sleep. The Bible doesn't teach soul sleep. The body falls asleep. The, the soul or the spirit of a believer goes to immediately to be with the Lord. Paul says, you know, I want to depart and be with Christ, which is very much better. So the, the body falls asleep. You remember in the John 11, Jesus said of Lazarus, he's asleep. Um, it says of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, when he died, uh, that he fell asleep. Because we have to remember in the Bible, death is separation. It's not annihilation. It's not the end. You remember in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, when they were uh, ate, ate of the tree, it says, in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. When they ate of it, they died spiritually. They were immediately separated from God. So there's that spiritual separation. When someone dies, there's a physical separation. The soul and the spirit separate. The body falls asleep. The spirit goes to be with the Lord. The third kind of death is the eternal death, where those who don't know Christ will be separated from God forever. But death means separation. I read about a, a tombstone one time down in Alabama, and it said uh, on it, it says, Here lies the body of Solomon Pease, it's spelled P-E-A-S, under the grass and under the trees. But Pease is not here, only the pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. <laughs> now, that is a description of what happens when a person dies. The peas shell out and go to God, and all that remains is the pod. So Paul wanted these believers to have a certain hope for themselves and for for those who knew the Lord, of those who've fallen asleep. Now, how certain is this promise? Notice what he says in verse 14, for if we believe, and actually in the Greek, the way you should translate that is, is for since we believe. It's not, well, if we believe Jesus died and rose, you know, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It's, It's stated in the idea that it's assumed to be true. For since we believe Jesus died and rose again, God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. So the teaching of the rapture is rooted in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's backed up by the resurrection of Christ. It's as certain as the resurrection and the death of our Lord Jesus. Did you notice here, though, it says that Jesus died, so God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep in Jesus Did you catch the difference? Jesus died so that if a believer dies, it's just called falling asleep. Did you notice the difference there? It doesn't say he died so that if we die, it softens our death. Our death then just becomes a falling asleep. So his death and resurrection is the basis for our resurrection. And he can perform the same miracle for us in resurrection uh, that he did for those who've died. Now, the end of verse 14, we see there's going to be uh, two classes of believers when Jesus comes. I mean, this is obvious. You're either going to be dead or you're going to be alive. It's that simple. God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who've fallen asleep. Now, you'll notice in verse 14, it says God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. Now, if if when a believer dies today, their body falls asleep and the immaterial part of that person goes immediately to be with the Lord, what is the Lord bringing with him? He's bringing the perfected spirits of these believers back. And we're going to see down in verse 16 that then the bodies are raised and they're rejoined to one another. So it's telling us what happens uh, to those uh, who've died. Now, the second reason we have a certain promise of the rapture is he was, Paul was given this by revelation. It says in verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, 
But we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who fall asleep. Paul received this revelation about the rapture from divine revelation. He didn't just make it up. He didn't have a wild dream one night about this. He says, I got this from the word of the Lord. And this may have been direct revelation God gave to him, or he may be referring back to John 14, 1 to 3, where Jesus himself mentions the rapture. But the rapture is called a mystery. Over in uh, 1 Corinthians, in fact, you might want to just kind of make a, a spot there and hold your finger there. In 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about the rapture as well. Over in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse uh, 51, or verse 50, it says this. Now, I, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood, that is our bodies like they are now, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood bodies can't inherit, the, they can't go into to heaven, to the eternal state. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. A mystery in the New Testament is something that had never been revealed before. Something that's never been revealed and that man could never figure out on his own, but that now is being revealed. If you had a photographic memory and you read the Bible from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to 1 Corinthians 14, and I ask you, how does a person get to heaven? The correct answer would be, you have to die. That's the way you get to heaven. You had to die to get to heaven. But all of a sudden now, a mystery is revealed. Something that's never ever been revealed before. And that is, there's going to be a whole generation of people who are going to do an end run on the grave. They're, going to, they're not going to sleep. They're not going to die. But they're going to be changed in a moment. I'm in the twinkling of an eye. This uh, verse, verse 52 here, where it says, We shall not all sleep. In other words, not everybody's going to die. We're going to have to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and get that new body to be with the Lord. But that verse, verse 52, that says, we shall not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. They used to hang over the nursery in the church I grew up in. They had that verse there outside the nursery. You get it? We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, that is not good Bible interpretation, but that is a good Bible application. I will say that of that, of that verse. So anyway, the first thing we see here is the certain promise of the rapture. The rapture is certain. It's a certain hope because it's grounded in the resurrection of Jesus, and it was given by divine revelation to Paul. Now, the next thing we see in verses 16 through 17 is the chronological program of the rapture, how it unfolds. Uh, the end of verse 15 begins to answer their main question. When will dead believers be raised? Because he says... Um, they will, uh, those who are alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. But in verse 16 and 17, he gives the sequence of events and the sounds that are going to accompany the rapture. And the first order of events is what I call the return. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Jesus himself, the Lord himself, is going to descend from heaven. And he's going to come back with a shout. You remember uh, in, the, at the, uh, in the cemetery where Lazarus' body was lying, it says Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And what happened? Lazarus came out of the tomb. When Jesus was hanging there on the cross and he cried out with a loud voice in Matthew 27, it says the tombs burst open. Remember, many of those who were in the tombs came out. And he's going to give this cry now from the heavens. And as we're going to see in a moment, those who've died um, are going to come forth. Uh, the voice of the archangel here is spoken of, probably to, to gather together uh, the angels. And the trumpet of God is sounded to gather uh, together the Lord's people. And it says over in 1 Corinthians, this is going to happen in the time it takes to blink your eye. The, the Greek word is an atomos. We get our word atom from that. It's something that can't be divided down any further. Um, and it's the time it takes to blink your eye, the, the quickest movement on a human body. They say it takes a 50th of a second to blink your eye, and the average person blinks 25 times a minute. So if you take a 10-hour trip in your car going 55 miles an hour, you drive 33 miles with your eyes closed. You might think about that next time you're traveling. <laughs> but what the Lord does... All, all this we're going to read about here tonight is going to take place in the time it takes to blink your eye. 
But what God does here is he slows this down for us. He slows down the, the game film, if you will, so we can see it one frame at a time. It's kind of like uh, watching a football game and they show that slow motion where you know the person gains possession of the ball and they get that one foot down and man, they just get it down to the you know microseconds of stopping it. That's what God's going to do for us. But as we go through this, don't think that it's going to be okay, the Lord's going to descend, then there's the shout, then there's the voice of the archangel, like this is going to be dragged out. All of it's going to happen in the time it takes to blink your eye. But God slows it down for us here so we can see all that's going to take place. Now, one of the things I've wondered about before is when when the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God take place, will people who are on earth who are left behind be able to hear these sounds? I don't know if you've ever wondered about that before. Now, the Bible doesn't say for sure, but remember in Acts chapter 9 when Saul's on the road to Damascus? Remember the people that are there with him? It says they could hear the sounds, but they couldn't understand what Jesus was saying to to Saul as he was there on the road, but they heard the sound and they were terrified. And I've often wondered if when the rapture takes place and there's this shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, these sounds may not reverberate around the earth. Think how that will add to the, the anguish of people who are left behind as they hear these things taking place and the fear that will cause. But the second event here after the the return is the resurrection, the end of verse uh, 16, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is the raising of the bodies of deceased church age believers. Now he says here the dead in Christ will rise first. So I take it this does not include Old Testament believers. Old Testament saints are not in Christ. Uh, We're placed in Christ by the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit, which is a part of the New Testament ministry of the Spirit, I believe. If you want to write down a verse for this, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, describes there the resurrection of the bodies of Old Testament saints. And I believe it places it at the end of the tribulation in conjunction with the second coming. So I take it at the rapture, only the bodies of church-age believers, the dead in Christ, will rise. Because the main purpose of the, of the rapture is to end the church age. You see, the day of Pentecost started the church age. And the day of Pentecost, remember, the Holy Spirit came suddenly upon them there. It, it happened dramatically and suddenly. So the church started suddenly, and it's going to end suddenly at the rapture. So it starts, you know, bam, you know, the day of Pentecost, it starts. The purpose of the rapture, the main purpose of it, is to end the church age. The church age will end, and then after that, uh, the the time of of the tribulation period will begin uh, not long after that. So the dead in Christ, he says, are going to rise first. I heard about a a, a debate years ago between a Baptist and a Presbyterian about who was going to go first when the Lord came, and finally the Baptist relented, and he said, well, you Presbyterians probably will go first. After all, it says the dead in Christ shall rise first, so... (laughs) And you've probably heard the old one, too. Why do the dead in Christ rise? They have six feet further to go. You know, there's all those old jokes about that. But, but the point here is Paul is showing the Thessalonians that the dead in Christ aren't going to be at a disadvantage. Because remember, again, what's the issue? What's their question? Are those believers who've died, are they going to miss out on the rapture? Are they going to be at a disadvantage? And he says, no, not only are they not going to be at a disadvantage when the rapture comes, they're going to rise first. Now, another question I've asked myself before as well is when the rapture takes place, will the, will the tombs and the graves here on earth be disturbed when the bodies come out of them? Now, they won't have to be, right? Because these will be glorified bodies. I mean, they could come right through the ground or wherever. But I've often wondered, you the, the tomb of Jesus, you remember the stone was rolled away. It didn't have to be. And you remember it says in Matthew 27, when Jesus is on the cross dying, it says that, um, you know, there was a great earthquake. You remember it was dark, and it says the tombs burst open. And many who were in them came out and walked around. I mean, it was like the night of the living dead, you know, there in Jerusalem. But it says specifically the tombs burst open. Again, I've wondered if when the rapture takes place, think about it, this sound is heard by people left behind. And if these graves and tombs all over the world are all disturbed where these bodies have come out. I mean, just think of the terror uh, that's going to fill people here on the earth who were left behind. By the way, I think the rapture may be the greatest evangelistic tool in human history because I think there's going to be many, many people who are left behind who know the truth and they didn't accept it. 
I think especially as these events are taking place, it's going to just strike fear in their hearts. There's a beautiful story I heard years ago from back in the Civil War. There were a group of soldiers who uh, didn't have anywhere to, to camp out at night. They just had to camp out in this open field without any tents or anything. And during the night, um, it snowed several inches. You, you all over here in Hawaii, you know what snow is, right? So, okay, yeah. Anyway, that's a bad joke. I know. But they, they all are lying out in these fields and snowed several inches. And the, the, the chaplain, when he got up in the morning with the troops, said he looked out over the field and there were these mounds all over this field. It's like fresh graves, really. It's these mounds, just hundreds of them all over this field. And as the trumpeter that morning sounded reveille for them to get up, every one of them kind of rose up out of there and the snow falling off. And he said, dramatically reminded him of what it's going to be like someday um, when the resurrection of the dead takes place at the rapture. So the Lord's going to descend. There's going to be a return. Uh, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. But the, the other thing is, what about people who are still alive when, it, when this takes place? And that's where we get the verse uh, 17. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is the removal now, or this is the rapture. We have a return, we have a resurrection, now this is the rapture. And the word here, most of you know this, the word caught up is the Greek word harpazo. And it's used 13 times in the New Testament. And it means to, to snatch or to seize or uh, to transport suddenly from one place to another. Now you'll often hear people say, in fact I was uh, talking with a guy a while back and a fellow was over, overheard our conversation at another table at a restaurant. And as he got up to leave, he came over and said, I heard you guys talking about the rapture and stuff. He goes, the word rapture is not in the Bible anywhere. You know, people believe in the rapture, believe in something that's not in the Bible. Well, you know, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Uh, the word Bible is not in the Bible. There's a lot of words that aren't in the Bible. But the word caught up here is from, uh, it's the Greek word harpazo. But when the, the Bible was translated from Greek into Latin by uh, Jerome, it's called the Vulgate. He used a Latin verb, the verb rapio, and became rapturo, and so that's where we get the word rapture. It's from the Latin. But I always tell people, look, if you don't want to call it the rapture, call it the harpazo of the church, the snatching away of the church, uh, whatever you want to call it, the word harpazo means to snatch away or to, to take away. So when people say the rapture is not in the Bible, there's going to be a time when believers who are alive and remain, it, the Bible says, are going to be caught up to meet the Lord um, in the air. Let me just mention a few of the places where you find this word. In John 10, 28, uh, Jesus said, no one can snatch you out of my Father's hand. That's the word harpazo. Um, in Acts 8, 29, you remember uh, Philip bap baptized the Ethiopian eunuch? And it says when the eunuch came up out of the water, that Philip was snatched or raptured 20 miles away to another place. He, all of a sudden, you know, Philip looks around and he's 20 miles away from where he was earlier. So he was raptured from one place to another. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, two different times there, Paul says, I was caught up to paradise. He was taken up to the third heaven where God uh, exists, to the throne room of God. Which That's one of the reasons why I think Paul loved the truth of the rapture so much. Did you know Paul had experienced a personal rapture? Sometime during his life, he was caught up to be with the Lord in heaven for some period of time. Where he says, I heard things where it's not permitted for a man to speak. Which I always think it's funny, all these people nowadays who claim to have been to heaven, they always come back and tell you all about it, you know, write books about it and hit the circuit. Paul says, I didn't talk, tell anybody this for 14 years, and he still doesn't ever describe what it was like there. He says, I, I heard things that it's not permitted, and saw things that's not permitted for a man to speak. And then in Jude 23, the same word harpazo is used where it says that sinners are snatched out of the fire uh, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look over again in 1 Corinthians 15. This tells us how this happens again. It just kind of gives us the order. It's another passage. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. He says, uh, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. It's talking about those who are alive. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. In other words, if you're alive here when the rapture happens in your human body, this mortal has to put on immortality. 
This perishable has to put on the imperishable. For this per- perishable will have to put on the imperishable, and this mortal will put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. There's a beautiful picture in 2 Corinthians 5 of what happens at the rapture. It pictures us in our bodies here now clothed. It pictures our body as like our clothing. But it says someday when the Lord comes at the rapture, we're going to be clothed upon. It's like putting an overcoat on over the clothes you've already got on. And that pictures the new body that we're going to get. It's like it's going to just be put on right on top of the old one. And it's going to just, the, the, the immortal is just going to swallow up mortality is the picture of it. We're just going to be caught up and just put on that new body like an overcoat and just swallow up this old one. And we'll be transformed body, soul, and spirit um, instantaneously. And you notice Paul says here uh, in this passage, he says, and we will be changed. Paul believed this could happen in his lifetime. He doesn't say, and you will be changed. He says, and we will be changed. Now, people will say, well, Paul believed this was going to happen in his lifetime, and it didn't, so he was wrong. Well, no, he doesn't ever say that it has to happen during his lifetime. He simply is stating the fact that he believes it could. And that's the way we should live as well. We should always say, the Lord could come in my lifetime. In fact, he could come... Uh, today, we ought to always live with that hope. Now, when the rapture happens, here's a good way to describe it that I've, I've liked. I heard this from a friend of mine years ago. It's like if you went up in your attic at your house or out in the garage and you had a box out there that had a bunch of screws and nails and bolts in there that you needed to get out of the box. But also in the box was a bunch of dirt and, and uh, fuzz and wood and paper and a bunch of trash and things in there. And you didn't want to dig through and get all those things out individually. So if you had a real big, powerful magnet, you could just take that magnet and hold it up over that box. And everything in that box that shared the same qualities or properties as that magnet would immediately be caught up into it and just glom onto it. And everything else would be left behind. And that's the way it's going to be at the rapture. It's going to be like the Lord is going to come in the sky, in the heavens, and he's just going to suspend himself in the sky. And everyone on this earth, dead or alive, who shares his properties, who's in Christ, is going to be caught up to him in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And everybody else is going to be left behind. He's just going to, all he's going to have to do is just come and suspend himself uh, there in the heavens. Now, one of the things that people will often say about the rapture is, when we talk about it, is that's just too bizarre for me to believe. Has anybody ever said that to you? Maybe you've thought that yourself. I mean, this just seems too strange and bizarre to think that's really going to happen someday. When people say that to me, I have two two answers I give back. One is the idea of a worldwide flood seemed weird back in Noah's day too, but it happened. And so God, most of the time things just go on and God lets history run its course, but at times God has come in and punctuated history with these dramatic events. It's happened in the past. It'll happen again. But here's another thing to remember. If someone ever says that to you, there have been several historical, literal raptures that have already happened. Think what happened to Enoch. Enoch was raptured, wasn't he? It says Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Hebrews 11 tells us, you know, he took him to heaven so that he wouldn't see death. Um, Elijah was caught up in a, a chariot of fire Was it when Elisha was down on earth. Paul himself, I just told you a few minutes ago in 2 Corinthians 12, twice he says there, I was caught up to paradise. The, uh, the ascension of Jesus, remember when Jesus ascended back to heaven? In Revelation 12, 5, his ascension to heaven, the word that's used there for it is harpazo. He was snatched up to heaven. So when people say, well, man, the rapture is just too weird to think about really happening, there's already been a bunch of raptures that have already taken place. The difference is all of those raptures involved individuals. The only difference with the rapture of the church is it's just going to involve a whole lot more people. But it's going to be the same kind of event uh, that's going to take place. When the rapture occurs, again, an entire generation of believers will not die. And I've always wondered what that would be like to be in heaven forever and to say, I never died. I was part of that uh, generation that got to do an end run on the grave. Uh, Like one of my old friends used to say, he says, I'm looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. (laughs) And I like that. 
Um, that's our hope in this world we live in. Is we're to be looking constantly uh, for the upper taker. So there's going to be a return. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead. There's going to be a rapture of those who are living. And then notice the end of verse 17. There's going to be a reunion. There's going to be a reunion when he says, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There are going to be countless reunions with loved ones there. But most of all, with our Lord Jesus Christ himself. One of the things that struck me a while back as I was reading through this passage again is, you know, we often talk about where we're waiting for the rapture. You know, the rapture is going to happen. We talk about the rapture. We talk about this, uh, the rapture as an event, which it is, and I'm not minimizing that. But sometimes I think we talk about we're waiting for the rapture, but I think we forget that really what we're waiting for is a person. It's not just an event or a happening. We're waiting. It says the Lord himself will descend. We'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's focused on the person uh, that we're going to meet and that we're going to be with. We're going to have a lot of reunions with other people that we're going to love to see there. But the ultimate thing is to be with the Lord. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but whenever we meet the Lord... We're not only going to be meeting our Redeemer, we're going to be meeting there and seeing face-to-face our Creator. Because the Bible says in John chapter 1 that without Him, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus Christ is the one who came and redeemed us, purchased us through His death on the cross, but He's also the one who made us. And that's the thing that's overwhelmed me the most when I think someday about the Lord coming. What will it be someday to look into the face of the one who made me? To look into the face of the Creator. So that old song was my uh, my grandma's favorite song. Still remember they sang it at her funeral. The old song, face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold Him, Jesus Christ who died for me. Face to face, oh blissful moment. Face to face to see and know. Face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ who loves me so. That's the hope uh, that we have um, as believers in Jesus Christ. And Jesus, of course, could come at any time. I like what G. Campbell Morgan, the great preacher, said one time. He says, I never begin my work in the morning without thinking perhaps he may interrupt my work and begin his own. He says, I'm not looking for death. I'm looking for him. That's a great way to live. Think about every day when you're driving to work or if you're in the home or school or wherever it is, think, you know, it's... The Lord may come today and interrupt my work and begin his own work. I love what uh, J.G. Bellett said. He said this in 1864. J.G. Bellett was a close friend. If you've heard of J.N. Darby, John Nelson Darby, he's one of his closest friends. He said this. He says, My precious Lord Jesus, thou knowest how fully I can say with Paul to depart and to be with thee is far better. Oh, how far better. I do long for it. People come and tell me of the crown of glory I'm going to receive. I bid them cease. They tell me of the glories of heaven, and I bid them stop. I am not wanting crowns. I have himself, himself. I am going to be with himself. And that's what we ought to be looking forward to in the rapture the most of all. is We're going to, we're going to be with a person, uh, the one who made us, the one who redeemed us. Now, one question always comes up. It says we're going to get caught up in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And then there's a big question we've got to answer. Where are we going to go from there? What do the post-tribs say? If you're a post-trib rapture person, what your, your view is, we're going to go through the whole tribulation here on earth, and we're going to get caught up with the Lord as he's coming down at his second coming. We're going to meet him in the air. And we're going to meet him and do a big U-turn and come right back down to the earth with him. That's the yo-yo view of the rapture I call it. Going to go up, come right back down to the earth. That's, what, that's the post-tribulation view. You believe in post-trib rapture. But if you believe in pre-trib rapture like I do, we're not going to go up and back down. We're going to go up and up and up. We're going to go to the Father's house. That's what Jesus said in John 14. He said, you know, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He says, I'm going to come and get you and take you to the Father's house. And to me, that's an argument, again, for pre-trib rapture. We're not going to go up and come back down. We're going to go 
uh, to the Father's house. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute, about the timing of the rapture. But he ends with this comforting purpose. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The rapture always has practical application associated with it. This was given to comfort those who've lost loved ones before the rapture takes place. And it still comforts us today. Paul says, look, don't worry that your loved one who died has missed the, 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 the rapture. I mean, they're not going to be raptured alive, but they're going to be caught up or their bodies are going to be raised and they're going to go before those of us who are alive um, and remain. We're going to join them one day. So he's saying, don't grieve about this as those who have no hope. So it's to give us hope in these days in which we live. Tim LaHaye is, uh, of course, the co-author of the famous Left Behind series. He wrote this in one of his books. He says, uh, My love for second coming teachings, particularly the rapture of the church, was sparked as I stood at my father's grave at the age of nine. His sudden death of a heart attack left me devastated. My pastor, who was also my uncle, pointed his finger toward heaven and proclaimed, This is not the last of Frank LaHaye. Because of his personal faith in Christ, one day he will be resurrected by the shout of the Lord. We will be translated to meet him and our other loved ones in the clouds and be with them and our Lord forever. That promise from Scripture was the only hope for my broken heart that day. And that same promise has comforted millions of others through the years. I've often wondered myself if Tim LaHaye's love for prophecy wasn't really placed in his heart at that moment when he was nine years of age. He heard his uncle, who was his pastor, say, you haven't heard the last of Frank LaHaye. We're going to be caught up uh, to meet him someday. That's the Lord's promise uh, that we can depend on. And the Lord wants us to live looking for that event and to be ready for it. Now, let me just stop here. We're going to have some questions and answers in just a minute. But I want to just mention a couple things about the pre-trib rapture about the timing of the rapture in relation to the tribulation. Most of you all know there there are five main views on the timing of the rapture. Um, It's not not, not complicated. There's only five. (laughs) Let me just mention them real quickly and just give a little quick statement about them and just give you a a few reasons why I think pre-trib rapture is true. Um, I'll come to pre-trib last, but, you know, it it believes we're going to be raptured before any of the tribulation. There's another view that's called the partial rapture theory, and that is believers who are really spiritual are going to get raptured before the tribulation, but those who aren't spiritual have to go through different parts of the tribulation. There will be different raptures through the tribulation as people get ready and get their lives right with the Lord. Now, I've never met anybody who believed in partial rapture who didn't think they were going with the first group. That's one interesting thing. If anybody I've ever met believes in partial rapture, they always say, well, I'm going with the first group, but, you know, a lot of other people aren't going to go who aren't ready. Well, the question would be, how ready do you have to be? It says the dead in Christ will rise, and we will be caught up with them. If you're in Christ, you're qualified. The other thing is, in 1 Corinthians, it says, we shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So whenever the rapture happens, it's everybody. It's all of us. And again, it's every person who's had their sins forgiven uh, by the Lord through faith in Christ. Really, you know, the the partial rapture is almost like I call it Protestant purgatory. Because, you know, you got to go through part of the, you know, different parts of the tribulation, you know, before you can can go be with the Lord. So that's not a biblical view. Uh, The the mid-trib view says it's going to take place at the middle of the tribulation. Uh, The the pre-wrath rapture puts it about three-fourths of the way through. And then the post-trib puts it over here at the very end in conjunction with the second coming. In other words, Jesus is going to be coming down at the second coming. We'll go meet him and come right back down. Now, I'll kind of deal with all those views, just as I mentioned uh, a few of the pre-trib views. But let me, uh, the arguments for pre-trib, let me just say a few things here. These are pretty simple arguments, but I hope they'll help you. Notice in 1 Corinthians 4.18, we just read, after talking about the rapture, he says, therefore comfort one another with these words. Now, how comforting would it be if you knew you are going to have to go through the whole tribulation to be able to meet your loved ones? I mean, to me, that's just not a very good argument. The comfort is you're going to go meet these believers who've died, but you're not going to have to go through the tribulation. Because actually, if you had to go through the whole tribulation, you'd be saying it'd be better to die, really, wouldn't it, than to have to go through that? So to me, the fact that it's supposed to be a comfort, it's called the blessed hope, I mean, uh, in fact, I think it's Tim LaHaye I heard one time say, if, if, the tribu- if we have to go through the tribulation before the rapture, it's not the blessed hope, it's the blasted hope. 
I mean, you know, to get all the way to the end. So that's one argument. Another point I would make is, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 4 that we just went through, notice chapter 5, how it starts. It says, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. What's the day of the Lord? It's the tribulation. When the order here, which one comes first, the rapture or the tribulation? Well, it's the rapture in chapter 4, and then it's the day of the Lord in chapter 5. The rapture comes before the day of the Lord. And notice the, notice the pronouns as I read 5, 1 to 3. This is very instructive. It says, Now as the times and the epics, brethren, you, that is you believers, have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while they are saying, he doesn't say while you are saying, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman, and they will, and in the Greek it's a double negative, and, and they will by no means escape. But look at verse 4. But you, brothers, notice the contrast, are not in the darkness that the day should overtake you. See the difference? He's saying, you, know, you guys know the day the Lord's going to come like a thief in the night, but while they are saying peace and safety, sudden destruction is going to come upon them, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in the darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. Also look down at chapter 5, verse 9. Notice what he says in 5, 9. He says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I take it the whole seven-year tribulation is going to be a time of God's wrath. The mid-tribbers say, well, no, the wrath just starts in the, in the middle. And, uh, you know, we're going to be in the first half, but the wrath's just the last half. Or the pre-wrath people say, well, no, the wrath is going to be the last fourth. And we're going to be here for the first three-fourths of it. If you look at the book of Revelation, the wrath of God starts in chapter 6 when the seals are opened. Who is it who opens the seal judgments? It's the Lamb. He's the one opening them. Now, I will agree that the wrath escalates. It gets worse. But it's God's wrath from the very beginning because it's the Lamb who's opening these seals, who's unleashing uh, these events um, upon the earth. Also in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, he says that we're to wait for His Son from heaven, that He raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. He's talking here, I believe, about the wrath of the tribulation period. He's just saying we're going to be delivered from that coming wrath. One other passage too, I won't turn to it, but you all are probably familiar with this. In Revelation 3.10, he promises the believers there um, who, who've trusted in him, he says that I will keep you from the hour of testing that's coming upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Notice he doesn't just say, I will keep you from the testing. He says, I will keep you from the hour of the testing, from the time itself. See, if this was a classroom here tonight and... Uh, Say uh, half of you all had made A's in the class and half of you hadn't. And I said, okay, next uh, Thursday night we're going to meet here and everybody has to show up uh, for the final test, but only those of, you who, uh, those of you who made A's don't have to take the test. But you still got to be here. You would be here during the time of the test, right? But you wouldn't have to take it. But if I said next Thursday night we're going to have a test and if you made an A, you don't have to show up. You don't have to be here for the time of the test. That would be pre-trib rapture. That's what Revelation 3.10 is saying, right? He says, I will keep you from the time of the test that's coming upon those, to dwell, those who dwell on the earth. In other words, we don't have to show up for the test. We're not going to be here. We're exempt from that very time itself, which I think is uh, the tribulation. One other argument I would use, and there's a lot of others, but this is the, this is the best one, I think, or the most important one. That's the, what's called the doctrine of imminency. That is that Christ could come at any moment. If you hold any view of the rapture other than the pre-trib view, you cannot legitimately get up tomorrow morning and say Jesus could come today. Because if you hold to a mid-trib view, we have to get through at least half the tribulation for Jesus to come back, right? So he can't come back today because we're not even in the tribulation yet. If you're pre-wrath, he can't come for at least five and a half years or so. And if you're post-trib, he can't come for uh, seven years because we're not even in the tribulation now. And I see the New Testament as presenting the idea that Jesus could come back at any time. 
You know, it says we're to be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior. Um, and, and, you know, in Philippians chapter uh, 3, it says, you know, the Lord is near. Just always speaks of this idea as if he could come back at any moment in time. So I think pre-trib is the only view that's consistent with this idea of the imminency of Christ, of, of his coming. And I think that's important because, you know, if I got up tomorrow and thought, well, you know, I know the Lord isn't coming back for three and a half years, five years, seven years. To me, it changes the way you live. When I get up every day, and I, I probably think about this, I would say nine out of ten days. I'm not going to stand before you and say I think about it every day. But most days, I get up and sometime during the day, I think to myself when I'm driving along wherever I am, you know, Jesus could come back today. And if you think about that, I promise you it'll change the way you live. Because there's some things you don't want to be doing and having him come back. Or maybe some things you want to be doing. It's a powerful motivator. And I think if we deny the imminency of his return, I think it's unbiblical, but I think it uh, doesn't have the same impact in our lives. There's a, a great old song that, that uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse years ago, he made a parody of this old song. And some of you probably may have sung it years ago, but it says, Jesus may come today, glad day, glad day, and I would see my friend, trials and troubles would end if Jesus would come today. And it says, glad day, glad day, is it the crowning day? I'll live for today nor anxious be. Jesus, my Lord, I soon may see. Glad day, glad day. Is it the crowning day? Well, Barnhouse used to say, if you're mid-trib or post-trib, then you have to say, sing that old song and say, Jesus can't come today. Sad day, sad day. And I won't see my friend. Trials and troubles won't end because Jesus can't come today. Sad day, sad day. Today's not the crowning day. I won't live for today. Anxious I'll be. The beast and the false prophet I soon shall see. Sad day, sad day. Today is not the crowning day. Now, that's an old parody on the song, but that really is true, isn't it? If you believe in any view other than pre-trib, then a person really has to get up every day and say, sad day, sad day. Jesus, he can't come today. I was talking to a guy, oh, I don't know, a year or so ago, and we were talking about the rapture. He says, well, I'm post-trib. I believe in the post-trib rapture. I said, really? I said, would well, you believe Jesus could come back any time? Oh, yeah, I think he could come back any time. So well, how can he come back any time if we're not even in the tribulation and he can't come to the end of it? And he said, well, you know, I never thought about that before. <laughs> and I point that out because a lot, we're, we're all that way. Sometimes we're, we, we're contradictory in what we think. And, you know, we, we may not be right about everything, but we don't want to be contradictory in what we say and what we think. I remember I was at a prophecy conference years ago and I heard a guy say, he said, I'm premillennial, I'm pre-trib, and I'm prepared. And I like that. The, the last one of those is the most important, isn't it? It's to be ready and be prepared. And I would assume that, you know, on a, on a Thursday night like this, when you come out to the service, that probably everybody here is a believer in the Lord. But I never like to assume that because I never know who's here. And so let me say this. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, tonight is the night that you need to accept him. Uh, the Bible says that when he died on the cross, he purchased a pardon for you, a full pardon from sin. The Bible says that God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I mean, that's the greatest transaction in all the world. He took all of my sin, and I get all of his righteousness. And it happens that moment you simply trust in Christ. You say, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, and I believe Jesus is the Savior that I need, and you trust in him and take him to be your Savior. So if you've never done that, that's what you need to do tonight. For those of us who know the Lord, may we live looking. That's how God wants us to live, to live looking for that blessed hope. Well, let's pray together, and then we'll have our question and answer time together. Father, we thank you that we have hope in this uncertain world that we live in. Father, there's so much fear out there today and so much uncertainty among people. We thank you, Father, that we have hope and that the hope that we have is in a person. It's the hope that someday the Lord himself will descend. So, Father, we look forward to that day when our faith will become sight. And I ask that you'd help us to live in light of that day, that you'd fill us with your hope. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Amen. All right. Okay, what we'll do is uh, have you just, if you have a question, raise your hand, don't be bashful. Either Mike or I will bring you the mic. 
Mike will bring you the mic. Uh, so, who wants to be the bold and the brave and the first? Marie, and then, okay. Hi, thank you. Um, with the Lord's Prayer, uh, when the Lord taught the disciples how to pray, one of the translations is, uh, that I've heard is about save us from the final trial. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've never really heard that referred to uh, in any of the limited studies that I've gotten on the uh, yeah, I've never heard that. You've never heard it? No, I mean, it, where it says deliver us from, the, from evil. Right. You know, some will say it's deliver us from the evil one. You know, from Satan himself, I mean, that could be there, but I've never heard that. You know, I mean, at the end, there's that ending of the Lord's Prayer, you know. Um, you know, the, uh, the, there's the longer ending about his kingdom, you know, and all of that. So, I mean, that could be what it's referring to, but. Yeah, because I've, I've seen a couple of translations that yeah. have uh, used that expression from the final trials, from the final tribulation, mm -hmm. rather than from evil. Oh, but, okay. Yeah, I, I've yeah. not seen that. No, I've just okay. seen evil or the evil one, yeah. Uh, I was raised Catholic most yeah. of my life, and uh, I raised all four of my children Catholic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've come, I said the Sinner's Prayer when I was in the Navy when I was 19, and I was probably, I was running around with some Christian sailors. And mm -hmm. even though I uh, I believed it when I said it, I received the Lord as my Savior and my personal Savior. The Lord's hand was on me all my life, and He brought me to this point, to this point today, where I, I have fully realized what it means to be saved and everything. But what I'm getting at is that my my four children are kind of, uh, you know, they don't, they're they're him and they're Han, and and, and yeah. I have one son that actually said the sinner's prayer. He repeated it after me, but he he doesn't go to church or anything, and. What what is that all about? Do you think that that would that would save him, or he believed it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we sometimes make things more complicated. I think you know, God makes it as simple as it can be. I, mean, I can't Rome, get the other ones to do it. <laughs> yeah, but in Rome, in Romans ten it says, "Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved." I mean, I think you know, we, you don't have to know very much. You don't have to know much. In fact, Jesus said you have to become like a little child you know, That's to right. be converted. So yeah. God knows our heart. And God knows whether we're, we're calling upon him, you know, we really believe in him. But if a person does that um, and they call upon the Lord to save them, um, that person is saved. Now, you know, we, you can go back and forth, you know, well, then if someone's saved, you know, there's going to be evidence in their life and you know, whatever. But that gets, that gets dicey, you know, looking at that. Well, how much evidence do you have to see? I mean, all of us, you know, it can be up and down. And to me, you know, you, if you want to look at that, you need to look at the person's life over a long period of time. I always take it, you want to look at the movie of their life, not the not snapshots. You know, any of us in snapshots can look pretty bad or good. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, you know, what you, you just keep praying for your children. I'm sure you do, and just you know, keep being a witness and an example for them yourself. And and uh, you know, God. One of the things we can take comfort in: God loves to save households of people. You know, he saved Lot and his family. He saved Noah and his family. He saved the Philippian jailer. And, you know, back at Passover, families were gathered, and the father put the blood on the door. They were saved as a group, as a family. So we see through the Bible that God loves to save families. And that's what I've always taken, you know, from Cheryl and myself with our boys. You know, when you have kids, there's no guarantee they're going to be believers. I've always claimed that promise. God loves to save families of people. So, yeah, God bless you. Thank you. Um, in regards to the rapture, yes. there's three things that come to my mind. There's Abraham's bosom, uh -huh. and there's the dead in Christ, and then there's the, those that are alive in Christ. Well, what do you know about Abraham, um, Abraham's bosom when uh, Christ came uh, into the, and he resurrected and he came and I think he, he brought them on, into heaven? And then there's, uh, how, like, what if you're cremated? Like, you know, if you're, if you're dead and your body goes to dust, mm -hmm. You know, how's, how's your body going to be put together? Or? Okay. I'll answer the second question first. Yeah, about cremation, you know. Of course, a lot of people, uh, believers, have been involuntarily cremated. You know, people were burned at the stake. You know, martyrs were. You know, people have died in wars and, you know, been burned up or, or you know, uh, get graphic, you know, been in explosions or whatever. So, you know, like the old saying is, there's not a maverick molecule in the universe. You know, God can put it all back together again, no matter where it is. Um, but the issue of should people be cremated, 
you know, there's nothing in the Bible that forbids it. But, you know, in the Old Testament, people were buried. In the New Testament, they were buried. I always tell people, you know, how would you like to have taken the body of Jesus down from the cross and taken it out and burned it, you know? Um, 1 Corinthians 6 says the body is the Lord's. And I think to me we send a message as believers about that we have a hope that that body is going to be raised someday. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians there that the body is planted in the ground. It's like a seed. You know, we plant it there in hope that it's going to be raised someday. So, you know, if someone... Some people just can't afford it, or I know some places, you know, maybe even over here, you know, I know in Japan, you, you can't be buried. There's no land over there you know, to do it, so you have to be cremated. If you can't, if you live somewhere where you can't do it, I guess you can't do it, but I think if you have a choice as a believer, it's better to be buried. I think it sends a message to people of that we believe God made the body and it's going to return to him. Um, your other question was about Abraham's bosom and all of that. There's different views on that. People take the idea that a lot of people have the idea that before the death and resurrection of Jesus, that Old Testament saints and, uh, and unbelievers you know, were in two different compartments down in the underworld or you know, paradise. There's two different parts to it. And they get that from Luke 16, you know, the rich man and Lazarus. And then they use Ephesians 4, where it says, you know, he came and took captive, a host of captives, you know. I don't, I don't hold to that view. I don't have time tonight to go into all the reasons on it. I actually, um, I just went through Ephesians at our church. And so you could get on our website at Edmund Faith Bible and look at that passage in Ephesians 4. And I went through it all on there. I take it that when Old Testament saints died, they went to heaven. Uh, they went to be with the Lord. Now, a lot of people say, well, how could they go to be with the Lord? Because Christ hadn't died yet you know, for their sins. But Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The reason I say that is, is a couple passages. Remember, it says Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. Evidently, God brought him to be with himself. And Elijah, Elijah it says that he, he it says the chariot, you know, came, and he, chariot took him, and he was taken to heaven. And uh, you have uh, uh, Moses and Elijah, you remember, that come and appear with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Seems to me they were with him and came there. So I take a different view of, you know, and on Luke 16, I just take it when Abraham, or when the, the, the rich man there looks over and sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham, I take that that's just, that's heaven. That's what he's saying into. Just another name for heaven. And I take it paradise is another name for heaven because the word paradise is only used three times in the New Testament. And the two of them, to me, it's clear that it's heaven. One is in 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul says, I was caught up to paradise, you know, to the third heaven. And the other time is in Revelation 2, where it talks about uh, to the church at Ephesus, he says, the overcomer will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It's talking about in heaven. So I think at paradise is, is a synonym for heaven. So anyway, that's a short answer to a more complicated question. But maybe I, hopefully I didn't confuse anybody. But. Uh, for, so is Abraham's bosom the equivalent for the Catholics as uh, purgatory? No, I just take it it was just another name that he's using there for uh, heaven. Because, see, going back to that parable, the rich man and Lazarus, the, a rich person like that, Jesus is telling that parable to a bunch of to, to Jewish leaders who are wealthy and who are very self-righteous. And so he tells them this parable about uh, a rich man. And to them, in their day, if you were rich and you were a Jew, you went to heaven. I mean, if you were a Jew, you went to heaven, especially if you were rich, because riches were a sign of God's favor. They had a real prosperity theology they had. So Jesus tells a parable, and here a rich Jew, and they believe that, that, that Abraham was standing at the gates of hell, and that if you were a Jew and you happened to wander down there accidentally, he was there to turn you back, and you couldn't go there, especially if you were a rich Jew. Well, now Jesus tells a parable where you got a rich Jew who goes to Hades and a poor beggar who goes to where? The bosom of Abraham. So that's why he calls it Abraham's bosom there, I think, that, to, to just kind of rub it into these guys a little bit worse even. You know, you're rich, and you think because you're rich and you're a Jew, you're going to go to heaven. Here's this poor man that's sitting out having his sores licked, which they think that's the worst. That guy's straight on his way to hell because he didn't have God's blessing. He said, not only is this poor guy going to come to heaven, he's going to be, he's lying there with his head on the bosom of Abraham. You know, the one that you think is going to turn you back, you know, when you get down there. So that's why I think in that parable specifically, he calls heaven the Abraham's bosom there. So.
may raise more questions than it answered there, but hopefully, but anyway. But a lot of people do take that two compartment theory and all that you mentioned. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. Yes, there are seven, six, over six billion people in the world, and there are many religions. Um, right. The Catholic is one of the larger ones, Anglican yeah. Church, um, First Methodist, um, First Presbyterian, sure. and um, United Church of Christ, and homosexuality is a growing mm -hmm. thing. It and is. it's a sin, uh, I call that a sin. Sure. And, but there's uh, people are experiencing more acceptance, in fact, uh, even in politics. Um, you know, they also are, are Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, and most of them, to my knowledge, don't teach the rapture. That's right. So I don't, I don't see how they can be saved or maybe I'm, anyway, I, I believe in being born again mm -hmm. and the rapture. Amen. Well, yeah, that's a sad thing. You know, mo a lot of, a lot of uh, people who I consider to be believers you know, who are born again believe in the rapture and the Lord's coming, but they never talk about it. I mean, they might as well not believe in it. You know, they never talk about it. It's sad. Now, we don't want to go to the other extreme and be, get on a hobby horse and just talk about prophecy all the time. That's, that's equally bad. You know, in churches, the, you know, all of us, we need to be balanced. We need to just talk about everything. But 28% of the Bible was prophecy at the time it was written. So if you teach the Bible, you're going to talk about prophecy. But that's the, the difficulty is people just kind of avoid it because, again, it's controversial. You know, it's like what I talked about tonight, you know, the different views on the rapture. Well, you can hold any of those views and be a born-again believer who loves the Lord. And I'm not going to fight, argue with people or fight with them about it. But, you know, people will say, well, I don't want to talk about prophecy and the rapture because it's so controversial. Well, I would say if you're going to avoid talking about anything that's controversial, you can't preach on anything. You know, baptism's controversial. You know, the Lord's Supper's controversial. I mean, every, you know, there's people that have different views about everything. So to me, you just get up, you go through, you explain what you believe, why you believe it. And, you, you know, we, we need to speak the truth, but we need to do it in love. And uh, that goes to, you know, the issue of homosexuality. You mentioned all of those things. The two things we need more than anything today in the body of Christ and all of our own lives and in churches is we need truth and we need love. And if we have, if you got a bunch of truth but no love, you end up being hard and, and, you know, people aren't attracted. But then if you're, it's just all love, you know, a lot of churches, a lot of love, but there's no truth. J. Vernon McGee used to call that sloppy agape, you know, just everybody loves everybody, but they don't know anything. But, and that's difficult to do, but I think that's what we ought to pray for ourselves. I think it's what we ought to pray for our pastors, our leaders, is that we'll know the truth, we'll fearlessly proclaim the truth but that we will be people of love as well. We'll really care about people. And I think if we can keep those things in balance, God will bless, it, bless what we do. I have two questions. Yes. I wanted to know if our pets would be raptured up okay. with us. All right. and, and number two, um, when Jesus comes back and, and defeats the Antichrist and reigns for a thousand years, are, are we who were raptured up, or is the church going to come back down and live on earth again. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think when we are caught up, we're going to caught up, get caught up and be with him during the tribulation when heaven, we're going to be judged, you know, the judgment seat of Christ. And then at the second coming, when this army is coming back with him, it says, you know, that there, those who are coming back with him are clothed in fine linen, you know, which is the righteous acts of the saints it speaks of in that passage. So we're going to be coming back with him to the, to the earth and we're going to reign with him for a thousand years and then on into eternity. And that we'll rule and reign on the earth, I believe, we'll have positions of authority, you know, based on our lives now. There's going to be rewards. Um, you know, somebody will be the mayor, somebody will be the dog catcher. I mean, you know, uh, maybe if there's animals there. So, you know, it's, you know, the old saying is this is training time for reigning time, you know, here now. But the question about animals in heaven, there's, uh, I was at a prophecy conference years ago. Have any of you heard of Dr. Walverd, John Walverd? I mean, you're talking earlier about how, you know, you'd read some of my stuff. Well, I've, everybody got their stuff from somebody else, you know. My, Mark Bailey, who's president of Dallas Seminary, he, he says he's got a big place up on his shelf called uh, Good Sermons I Stole from Other Thieves. <laughs> and uh, anyway, you know, everybody learns stuff from everybody else. But Dr. Walverd, um, he passed away uh, eight years ago, but he was uh, really the, the dean of Bible prophecy. And I was at a conference that he was at years ago. He's probably in his 80s at the time. And a lady out in the congregation out in the group she said 
I, I got a dog that I just love so much, and my dog died. You know, and she said, I just want to know if my dog's going to be in heaven. Because, you know, I just, he meant, meant so much to me in my life. And, you know, they had a bunch of other guys on the panel who were younger, and they all gave these long, you know, theological kind of answers. Well, they came to Dr. Walver, and they said, well, Dr. Walver, and everybody was waiting to hear what he would say about this. He said, what do you think about pets, you know, being in heaven, people's pets? He, he sat there for a second, and he looked at the lady with real great tenderness, and he said, well, ma'am, he said, would it make it heaven better for you if your dog's there with you? And she said, well, yes, it would. And he said, well, then he'll be there. <laughs> I mean, that's a great answer, isn't it? I mean, and his point was, anything that makes our life better and more enriched and more full, it's, that's what heaven's going to be. Um, I do think there's evidence. I mean, you can look in Scripture. God made the animals. They're good. I mean, it talks about during the millennium, you know, the lion's going to lay down with the lamb. I mean, there's going to be animals then. Um, I don't see any reason why, I and mean, that's part of the beauty of creation that God's made. Now, you know, is every, you know, cow that, you know, was, you know, butchered for meat or whatever going to be raised in the future? I don't know. But, you know, animals that people loved, you know, I don't see a reason uh, a reason to, to, to see any problem with that. Yes? I don't know if my husband will have the detail, but I was just wondering, can you tell us when we believers go to heaven? Yeah, I think it's going to be during the uh, time after we're raptured to heaven. So I think we're going to be caught up to heaven. And then at the Lord's coming, it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says when the Lord comes, it says don't, don't go on judging before the time, for when the Lord comes, you know, we're going to all have to stand there before him. So I take it it's during that time of, of while the tribulation is going on earth, we're going to be judged, which that's another reason why I believe in pre-trib rapture, because when the saints come back with Christ at the second coming, we've already been rewarded because we have the righteous, the linen on, the fine, righteous acts of the saints. Well, if we just go up and meet him and come right back down, the post-trib view, when did we get rewarded? So it has to, to happen during that time. So I think we'll be caught up, we'll be rewarded and judged during that time, during that period of time. And that's one of my favorite messages. I'm going to bring that over at the conference. It's, I call it how to get ready for the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a sobering thing, but it's an exciting thing to think about um, ahead of time. And on, on Sunday, by the way, just to mention to you, I think on Sunday here I'm going to do just kind of a message of, just a lot of the things that are happening in our world, kind of signs of the times, the events that are taking place. But this is an important thing, and I'll probably mention this in that message too. I'll probably repeat myself. But think about this. All the signs of the times are signs of the second coming. There aren't any signs for the rapture. So see, all the signs that we see in our world are signs of the second coming. And it's the old saying, if you can already see the lights of Thanksgiving, I mean lights of Christmas, then Thanksgiving must be pretty close. And that's the way it is with the rapture. If we can already see the signs of the second coming, then how close must the rapture be? So um, I'll be talking about some of the things we just see in our world that are you know, really dramatic. And a lot of them you know about. We'll look at some of those things together. So does anybody else have anything or do we need to? Okay, no, that's great. I'm, I'm fine with it. I just don't want to wear everybody out. People start sneaking out the back door. <laughs> yeah. Here, here you go. You want to ask? I was going to proxy this for my mom, but she said she'll ask it. Oh, okay, good. Uh, this, this often, uh, well, I often wondered about this question. Okay. Is it true that our last breath on earth will be our first breath in heaven? Is, is, is that when we go to the beamer seat to face Jesus? Well, my, why, the way I would see it is, is whenever a person dies here on earth, as we looked at earlier, their body, you know, falls asleep, and immediately their spirit, their, you know, the immaterial part, goes to be with the Lord. And then as we saw at the rapture, he's going to bring with him, you know, the immaterial part, and the body's going to get raised, and it's going to be put back together. And then that's when I think we're going to appear before the Lord at the judgment seat. It's at the rapture. It's after the rapture. That way, that's when everybody, the living believers in the church age will have been caught up, the dead will have been rejoined. That's when we'll all be there. And then I think that's when the judgment seat's going to take place. Some have the idea that, you know, the moment each believer dies, you know, because we'll often say about someone, you know, well, so-and-so died, you know, he's gone on to the, to the judgment, yeah, you know, to meet the Lord or whatever. And we're, we're with the Lord, but I don't think the judgment takes place till the rapture um, of the church. That's the way I see it. Now, I think when we, a person, say if a person died 200 years ago, and, uh, you know, they, they've been there all that time. I mean, time's going to go real quick in heaven. 
Um, you know, I don't think heaven's timeless. I often hear people say that, well, we won't have any consciousness of time in heaven. I don't think that's true because it talks about in uh, Revelation chapter 8, it says there was silence in heaven for about 30 minutes, and, uh, which is an interesting statement to make. But it seems like there's some consciousness of the passage of time. Also, like in Revelation 6, there's a group of people there who've been martyred. They've been killed for their faith. And they look at the Lord and they say, Lord, how long is it going to be until you're going to you know, take uh, vengeance for us, you know, for those who martyred us? So they seem to have a sense of time there in heaven. So, but, but, it, but I think it'll go quicker. You know how it is when something's going good, time goes faster, and when it's bad, it's slower. So I think it'll go quicker, but I think we'll still have a consciousness of the passage of of events. So I think, you know, when the ra- after the rapture, that's when everybody's going to be gathered there for the judgment seat of Christ. But we'll talk about, we'll talk more about that on, uh, let's see, on uh, Saturday uh, afternoon. I think someone's speaking on that topic. So, yes, there's someone, someone back there in the back there. You can just say it real loud if you want. Or, <laughs> oh, okay. Can you explain the different levels of heaven? The levels of heaven. Oh, okay, about the, how I mentioned the third heaven a minute ago. Yeah, there is no seventh heaven. You know, we talk about that. You know, the Jews had ideas of, you know, like seven heavens or nine, or people have had different ideas. In the Bible, it speaks of uh, the third heaven. You know, Paul says, I was caught up to paradise, and he says that's the third heaven. So we know there that the third heaven is where God exists. It's outside time, space, matter. The first two heavens, like the first heaven would be the atmosphere of our earth. Because you'll often talk about, you know, the birds fly up in the heavens. Well, obviously it's not talking about out in outer space. It's our atmosphere. The the second heaven would be outer space. Which, again, when you think about that, space is expanding at 186,000 miles per second, the universe is. Which I always think of myself, well, what's out there? You know, what's it expanding into? I mean, think about that. So that's the second heaven. All of, so you could call it the atmospheric heaven is heaven number one, the stellar heaven where the stars are and outer space. And, but the third heaven is where God exists, which is outside this time, space, matter, continuum. I mean, there's a sense in which I think where God exists and you know, there's an invisible warfare going on around us of angelic beings. I mean, it, there's a sense in which it's, it's as far away from us as it could ever be, but there's another sense in which it's right here. I mean, you know, when a person dies, they, they leave this, you know, time-space continuum and they go to that, that other, other dimension or whatever, if you will. Um, but those are, those are the three heavens the Bible speaks of. Um, you know, birds fly in one heaven, and you know, David says, you know, I consider the heavens, you know, your handiwork, and the third heavens where God is. Somebody in the very back there. Oh, you can go do this first, yeah. Go ahead. Um, My question... Hello? Yeah, okay. Some of my questions were already answered about uh, when Christ comes back for the second coming, what's he doing? And you answered that about the Antichrist. And then the other one was, yes, the believers come back. But what happens to the people who weren't raptured? What are they doing uh, while we're reigning for a thousand years with Christ after the you tribulation. Mean the people who are left behind yes. in the rapture? Yes. Well, what's going to happen at the rapture? You know, the, the, the believers are going to get caught up. People are going to be here on the earth. You know, a lot of people are going to die during the tribulation. I mean, it's, you know, you read the book of Revelation, half the people die in just two of the judgments. You know, the fourth seal, fourth die, uh, the fifth, uh, sixth uh, trumpet judgment, uh, third die. So just those two judgments, half the people on the earth die. So it's going to be you know, massive carnage. But at the end, the nations are gathered there at Armageddon. Um, Christ comes back at that point in time. And Matthew 25, you might read that passage, if you starting in verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes. Now, again, think about this. Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives uh, two days before he's going to die on the cross. This is a pretty audacious statement for a guy who's getting ready to die who's got 11, fo- you know, 11 followers there. He says, when the Son of Man comes... He says, and all the holy angels with him, he's going to sit on his glorious throne. And he's going to gather all the nations before him. That's all the people who lived through the tribulation. And he says he's going to separate them. He's going to put the, the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. So when he comes back, there's going to be people on earth who are believers and unbelievers. 
Because all the believers get caught up before the tribulation, but during the tribulation, some other people are going to come to faith in the Lord. And so when he comes back, there's going to be sheep and goats. And it says that the sheep are going to go into the kingdom, the believers, and the goats are going to go into uh, perdition. They're going to be taken away at that time. So then everybody who enters the millennium at that time will all be believers. But some of the people going into the millennium will go in in human bodies. There are these people who lived in their bodies during the, through the tribulation. They'll go on into the millennial kingdom in their human bodies. They'll have children. They'll live here on the earth. And that's part of what we'll be doing is judging them and, and serving and ministering for the Lord. So when he comes back, I mean, it's going to be dramatic. But again, think about that. I mean, there Jesus is. You're, you're, the apostles are sitting there listening to this guy saying, I'm going to come back someday, and the angels are going to come with me, and I'm going to sit on my throne, and all the nations are going to be gathered before me. You've got to be looking at this guy thinking, this guy is either crazy or, you know, but they looked into his eyes as he was saying, and they believed what he said. They believed that he was really the son of God, and he was really going to do that. I mean, I've, uh, I love to talk about what I call the amazing claims of Jesus, and that's one of them. I mean, that's an amazing claim that he made, that he's going to come back and judge the whole world. One other one I think back you to. You mentioned um, Elijah, uh -huh. Enoch, and you even talked about the saints when Christ comes. What is your perspective with the verse in Hebrews 9.27, where it talks about that it is appointed until man wants to die? Okay. Yeah, in Hebrews 9.27, I, I would take that verse as stating, the, I mean, the general rule. Because, I mean, you think about it, up to now, everybody who's lived, you know, other than the people who are alive, everybody's died. I mean, except yet Enoch and Elijah. Those are the only two. So it's pretty, you know, it's pretty good odds. You know, I mean, everybody dies. But we know those two men didn't. Now, what some people will say is, well, but Enoch and Elijah are going to come back as the two witnesses you know, in Revelation 11, so they're going to die and they have to come back for that. But we just read tonight where it says, we shall not all sleep. And sleep there refers to death. We're not all going to sleep, but we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So there's going to be a whole generation of people who aren't going to die. So the rapture itself is proof that the statement in Hebrews 9.27, I think is stating what is the overwhelming general rule of humanity is it's appointed the man wants to die and after that, you face the judgment. But Enoch and Elijah were exceptions, and the generation that's alive at the rapture are going to be exceptions. But for everybody else, I mean, it's been a pretty good general rule that's applied uh, throughout time. I mean, you can pretty much say to most people, it's appointed the man wants to die, and after that comes the judgment. So I think, I think that's what the way you have to take that statement. Uh, I'll tell else? you what, we'll take just one more Yes, you want to come back over here? Daniel okay. chapter 7 speaks about the Antichrist is going to wear out the saints of the Most High. We don't want to do that tonight here. Really, really, so. Okay, I had a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I had a question regarding, um, like, interpretations and stuff. Many people in churches today misinterpret the Bible. So once, like, all the pastors are gone on earth and have been raptured, mm -hmm. what happens to those who are still here and misinterpret? Or is their ultimate um, goal just... To be saved well that's a good question you know, we got a lot of pastors here now and there's a lot of misinterpretation going on with them here so um, no I think you know during that period of time uh, after the rapture uh, the Lord obviously is going to do some very supernatural things in people's lives you know, you're gonna have the 144,000 you know in Revelation 7 these Jewish converts who I think you know you're gonna have like 144,000 maybe Saul of Tarsus like experiences you know, when a lot of these people, a lot of these Jewish people are coming to the Lord, they know the Bible. See, it's just like when Saul became a believer, you know, he didn't have to go to Bible college and learn the Bible. He knew the Bible. I mean, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he knew the scriptures. What happened at that period of time is all that stuff that he knew, all of a sudden, all clicked. You know, of all this that he knew, then he began to see it in the true light, you know, which it was intended. I think that'll be the way it is with, with a lot of people who know a lot about the Bible but they don't know Christ. And so a lot of this stuff's going to come to bear. And I'm sure the Lord for a lot of these people too will compress into a very short period of time, you know, and, and, and give them great power, you know, to do what he's called them to do. Um, but, you know, we don't know what it's going to be like here. I think God's going to do a lot of amazing things of instructing people and teaching them during that time. But, I mean, obviously people will be getting saved and will be, you know, 
avoiding Antichrist's persecution and all kinds of things going on in the earth when that's, when that's taking place. All right. Is that it? All right. God bless you guys. Thanks. Why don't you all stand? Uh, we want to close in worship, or did... Leitu has left the building. <laughs> Come on up. We want to encourage you and invite you, uh, if you're able, to uh, stick around. We have a lot of really good food, and we'd like to uh, invite you, especially if you're visiting tonight, and please don't worry about, well, I didn't bring anything. Uh, that's okay. We got plenty of food. So uh, if you're able to stick around and break bread with us and, and fellowship with us. Also, as Pastor Mark had mentioned, uh, if you're here tonight and you have never committed your life to Jesus Christ, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. So after the worship team is done uh, closing us in worship, uh, we're just going to ask you to come forward. There'll be some people up front here. Uh, I'll try to hang around. Uh, you can find me pretty easily. Uh, I'll usually be by the food uh, out there. But find me. I'd love to have the opportunity to talk with you and even pray with you as well. So let's, uh, let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing us this privilege tonight to have Mark with us. And Lord, it's just so rich and so much and we lord need for your holy spirit to take all that we've seen and read and heard and bless it to our hearts and the application of it to our lives lord we're so looking forward to what you have for us this weekend and even on sunday so lord we just pray your blessing on all the speakers on this conference and lord on all who are here tonight especially for those who do not know you that tonight would be the day, the time of their salvation. Also, Lord, bless the food that we're going to eat. Bless the fellowship. Lord, you want it to be glorifying and pleasing to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.